Yeah, I wanted to come on to kind of apologize for not being present in quite quite a number of months. Uh, I've been going through a personal issue with um, the church I uh, attended, and for it's a lot of personal issues there. So, uh, regarding that matter, I just I was just uh, dealing with a lot of stuff, so I couldn't really get involved in, you know, in forwarding this channel even more. Also, I'd like to say that now going on from there and not addressing that anymore, but um, going on from there, I wanted to talk about how I would best forward this channel to the best of my ability at this point. Right now, I'm working on another project. And this project has to do with uh, eschatology and uh, you know conspiracy theories right now. So I can't. I I've been a little bit unfocused with that project. So and I, it's going to be in another channel. So I'm I'm much more concerned about that right now. In regards to my um, this channel and presuppositional apologetics and really clearly defining to the best of my ability how Van Til defined this apologetic. Uh, that's the goal of this channel. That's the, that's the bottom line goal. It's not going to be pristine perfect. Uh, there's going to be areas that I miss out on. Uh, in regards to moving on from there, in regards to uh, to presuppositional apologetics itself and how it has been presented in on the internet so far I, i've i've seen things that are you know from the most part satisfactory from the links that i po posted there I, from uh choosing hats.com some you know they the guys there have done some great work i i believe and uh i I hold to their approach pretty much. Uh, you've you've had also uh, some more lay apologists that have utilized this apologetics, and you know, you know, I have my reservations. I even have my reservations about putting myself out there, and the reason is is because I want to try to make sure I have enough of a solid foundation of, of of my knowledge of this approach as I possibly can and I want I don't want to misrepresent this this approach to apologetics I have been doing some other stuff so it's really been hard for me uh, I have other than that I've been doing some uh, I had been doing some reading on Immanuel Kant and Immanuel Kant is a if once you understand Immanuel Kant, once you understand it, it's really hard to understand him. You have to really do a lot of reading for that. But once you understand him, then you get you 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 realize that uh, the unbeliever has no um, foundation for knowledge really whatsoever. So um, that's in in regards to to the rationalist, for example. The continental rationalists attempted to find a foundation for knowledge apart from ultimate some ultimate authority, and they tried to find it within the cognitive within the cognitive faculties of their mind. And as a result, there was a lot of these unanswered questions. So then the empiricists. The British empiricists came up with their own theories, and as that resulted from not being able to have knowledge through the op the a priori, to trying to develop knowledge through mainly the a posteriori. Now, let's take a look at this. The a priori would be would be uh, the one uh, I would I consider the the one 
uh, the a posteriori would be the many in in, in, in epistemology. And when the continental rationalists failed and the British empiricists tried to to establish the foundations for knowledge through sense experience, they ran into a problem. There's I.E. Hume's problem of induction. So you got you developed that problem, not only the problem of induction, but you also had the idealism of a um, I for, I'm forgetting his name. It's slipping in my mind. Let me get it. It's um, Ber Barclay. Barclay's uh, Barclay's idealism, and his understanding of knowledge is that if if it's not in sense experience, it cannot, of essence, exist. Therefore, there go. If the table or the chair is not in front of me, if my either of my five senses do not pick up on it, ergo, it does not exist. So the the desire to establish knowledge through sense experience using empiricism really fell apart right there you know and Hume's problem of induction that's also added to added to the strain of the difficulty of how knowledge can be gained through sense experience in empiricism for example you drop a ball onto the onto the ground you pick you know you pick it up Upon what basis can you know it's going to fall again? You also you always have to rely on previous experience. In other words, you're not relying purely on sense sense knowledge. Since you're re not relying purely on sense knowledge, and you're relying on previous experience, then you must be relying on an experience that's outside of the realm of the sense okay so then Immanuel Kant came in and tried what he tried to do was to combine the the a priori a posteriori and it's it could be argued Van Til actually Van Til actually says that that's what Plato tried to do he Plato attempted to account for knowledge mainly through the ideas and then from there he later in life later in his life developed believed that he can develop knowledge through sense experience and then much later when he got older towards his death he said he wanted to go for both to try to account for knowledge in both sense experience and the a priori. Well, same thing has happened except in a much wider sense with the continental rationals, the British empiricist, and the continental rationals I'm referring to, I'm, I'm referring to Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz, and there may be some other names there. Uh, with the British empiricists Hume, Locke, and and Barclay, and either one of these these um, approaches to to try to establish the the preconditions for knowledge really couldn't really couldn't do it really because because you were actually starting from from either a rationalist foundation or an empiricist foundation. And Immanuel Kant, what he attempted to do was try to establish his own transcendental argument, which was probably the first time in modern history 
that uh, the transcendental had been utilized. There, there might have been some ancient philosophers that utilized transcendental argumentation, but he's Kant was the first in modern history to try to establish knowledge through uh, transcendental argumentation. So what he did was, if I can just remember, is um, his understanding was that there was a unity in in our knowledge, and that unity ultimately came from the self. And there was the plurality within our within our knowledge, and that came with the the many perceptions that we gather together in our thoughts. For example, I see a cup. For example, I see its different properties, various properties, various shapes, various what whatever it is that makes it what it is and and upon that I establish the I, I establish that it is a cup I, d I wanted to be careful not to say I established cupness because cupness would presuppose a uni a, a universal assumption and Kant was actually very careful not to establish that that uh, for example cup was universal in fact he was in fact he called the objects of the various perceptions he called them categories now he called them categories upon the basis of of taking the many perceptions and bringing them together now, to bring categories into a, a very easy to understand perspective, to try to try to establish the easy to understand perspective, like let's let's take the word categories as we use it every day. The word categories as we use it every day, for example, uh, let's say I let's say we have. Like a ten dollar bill. Now a ten dollar bill. Now and let's take take a five dollar bill. Now let's take a one dollar bill. All that falls into the category of money. And having that fall under the category of money, there's there's a un there's a unity of that one category in again Kant did not emphasize any universals but he did try to establish that there was a unity in our knowledge but that unity was ultimately through the self through through what he would call the transcendental unity of apperception um, now the particulars would be the I really don't remember it's because quite a little a little bit of time since I've studied Kant but through this like I said using this using this as an example now let's go back to cup cup has different properties that when come when it comes together it It, it it establishes a category of cup again again not cupness but it establishes a category of cup now also he can't also seem to try to reconcile he tried to defeat Barclay's uh, idealism through what he called transcendental idealism and this I haven't I studied this I haven't gone back to in, in a while but it was through the antinomies of pure reason that 
he came to under to the the understanding of his transcendental idealism. His transcendental idealism was that was well. Let's say he tried to prove that transcendental idealism was real. In other words, what Kant was establishing was that even though objects are not in our sense perception, they still nevertheless exist outside of it. Right? And it was through the antinomies of pure reason that he used, he attempted to try to prove this he I'm sorry he attempted to try to prove through the antinomies of pure reason that objects existed through um, to us unperceived and you know this this ran into a lot of problems in in his epistemology and one of the problems one of the problems was that when he tried to establish the preconditions for knowledge or no, I'm sorry to establish uh, that now that objects can exist unperceived through his transcendental idealism in his antinomies of pure reason the very antinomies though pure reason in order for him to establish that ob objects exist unperceived through his transcendental idealism he had to demonstrate that there can he could arrive to what he what's called the unconditioned now at the same time his criticism of the I'm sorry the the rationalist was that rationalists thought they could so easily arrive at knowledge arrive at the foundations of knowledge but upon upon further and further persistence they really couldn't arrive at the foundations of knowledge so to to give you an example of the antinomies of pure reason uh, let's take for example and this this would be probably similar to what I said before but there, there's a different spin to this let's say uh, let's take a laptop for example now a laptop desktop would fit and of course nowadays we get tablets as well would fit under the category of computer now let's take computer stereo system television that would go under this category of uh, the the umbrella the umbrella of uh, technology now underneath technology you have all sorts of electrical systems electrical whatever you can conceive of that's electrical that would go under the the, the umbrella of electronics or electrical now you got that going up to infinity okay so the problem was is that when you ch attempt to go up you either end up in an infinite regress right or you have what's called the unconditioned conditioner I believe that was 
Kant's fourth antinomy, of pure reason, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That's the fourth antinomy of pure reason. So, in essence, you have what's called the unconditioned in, in, in respects to knowledge. So, understanding that in trying to prove that objects can exist unperceived through the antinomies of pure reason, he ran into the problem in his antinomies by not providing that who, the establishment of who that or what the unconditioned is. Cornelius Van Til established, and this is in his in his um, work, uh, why I believe in God. It was God who is, as he calls in that work, the all conditioner. So that it is God who is the precondition of everything that's conditioned and everything that is everything that exists exists because of him every, everything that we know about knowledge itself exists because he provides us with the preconditions and so in in retrospect to what I was saying about Kant trying to establish the transcendental idealism or his understanding that objects can per exist even without our perception that can really only be established through a Christian theistic worldview knowledge itself has within itself and this is not all knowledge this is all of reality has an inherent unity and diversity and that inherent unity and diversity cannot make sense apart from a Christian Trinitarian theistic view of reality so what I'm trying to say is that the transcendental argument for existence of God runs much deeper than accounting for laws of logic, laws of science, laws of morality. It counts. It goes much deeper than that. So that, as as Paul says, as the Apostle Paul says. The unbeliever is left with no excuses, for he knows on the day of judgment he will face his creator, and he will be judged based upon what he knows in all of creation and in all of knowledge. I just wanted to leave it at that. I hope I made myself clear, and I please please pray for me, brothers, that I can continue making more presentations like this because I really want this channel to start taking off. Uh, I plan on pretty soon, maybe starting a series on sociology and how a van taking a Vantillian approach to sociological thought. But thank you anyway. Uh, this is uh, Van Til's Prodigy signing off.